what's going to happen. Ah, so, where do we leave off? I don't know. All I was thinking about was... <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think actually we, we were... We were talking about, or you were talking about, you didn't think that human beings were built to travel into space. That we were actually the, talking about the limits of human biology. And indeed, yeah. you're absolutely right. Uh, we're not built for space travel. And you were talking about, if anything, it would be technological creations and, and little... Little tiny things. Little tiny things that would go out and self-propagate. Yeah, Malthus. Um, the, maybe it's not healthy to think that way because the Elon Musks of the world have to not be like Malthusian. And so long as life goes on, Malthus is wrong. So he's like, for all of history, Malthus has to be wrong because he can only be right once. <laughs> so maybe it's not the best. Uh, it's like, it's like uh, Pascal's wager, but in reverse, right? So it's like Pascal's pessimism, I guess. But you can't, um, I guess you can't be that guy. I guess you have to be the person who is dumb enough to start an electric car company, you know? And then smart enough to make it work. Or the guy who like believes we're going to colonize Mars, regardless of how this is not a good engineering undertaking. Uh -huh. Leaving doing things in gravity wells is just a bad idea. But I mean, in theory, we, we do have all the technology necessary today to at least begin colonizing the Lagrange points. Mm -hmm. um, you'd be more you'd be more familiar than most about Lagrange points. That's why I like these conversations. Is because oh yes, I've actually I happen to have actually read about that. So, <laughs> so most people are like, what the heck are Lagrange points? And I have to explain. There's two orbiting bodies, and there's two additional points, um, L L3 and L5, I believe. You know, L5 is uh, is a big one. There is the one. There's a, there's a L5 society is the Lagrange five point somewhere between um, Earth and the moon. Well, kind of, it's the third area. But we can at least colonize those with rotating space habitats. And I think engineering the habitat itself is fairly comparatively straightforward to like colonizing something down a gravity well with an atmosphere that is enough atmosphere to be a problem, but not enough atmosphere to be a solution to anything. Just right. <clears throat> I don't think you know, also we just don't have the like one thing that makes earth difficult is um, we have a gravity well that's large enough to where no known material can make a space elevator not even like carbon nanotubes tough as they are still not good enough to space elevator us out if we had mm -hmm. something more like the moon's gravity then, then the steel would get you there but an electron volt is an electron volt, and those that that's what sets the um, sets the fundamental like strength of covalent bonds and chemical bonds. You're not going to make a material that can make a space elevator tough enough to get us off of this rock. It's always going to have to be a rocket or something really energy expensive. Mm -hmm. We get off here by Newton's third law. We have to throw stuff out the back faster than we, we want to. To move forward, it's terrible. Well, it's very difficult, but I don't know. I guess the the optimists um, will always have the day, so long as there is a day to have. Uh, there will be. I can remember. No, no, no. That's the wrong way to put it. I can remember reading. <laughs> In the 1890s, there was a famed French physicist who proved beyond a shadow of a doubt scientifically impossible for heavier than air flight. Yeah. And then and the Wright brothers. At, there was a great I love the story of the Wright brothers because they were intergovernmental like cooperative multi-million those dollars back then. Multi-million dollar affairs to try to make powered flight that flunked. And mm -hmm. then some bicycle shop guys. I know. <laughs> that kitty hop. <laughs> I love that story. 
I, I, I like I like bringing that up against like scientism people, people who are like the science is settled and 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 this is what science says. That's the most anti-scientific thing I've heard. It is the most anti-scientific thing. Right. I mean, if you if you talk to scientists, you'll find that most of what they do is disagree with each other. Um, there is a narrative that tries to like back itself up off of scientists, and they're people too. So when you say, "Hey," I got a bunch of grant funding for you. Um, just go ahead and say that Greta Thunberg was right about stuff. You know, that, that they're going to go for it. It doesn't, doesn't mean that that's actually true. Balance of the humors was an established and esteemed scientific medical theory for hundreds of years. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. The guy who invented antiseptics was put in an insane asylum for the radical idea of saying, wash your hands. This and that is something to to be wary of and study, because he was right about antiseptics. We didn't know why he was right, and his justification, his theory, was something akin to like washing away the the humors or something. But his mm -hmm. theory was debunked because his his explanation for why this worked was a crap explanation. Mm -hmm. And the theory is w many steps behind practical application. There's tons of stuff that does stuff that we can't under understand. So when you try to get something accepted by the scientific community, it goes both ways. You can have a theory that sounds very good and compelling and it will be overly accepted and will be biased for it when maybe t sometimes we won't. We'll have a mm -hmm. false positive. And you can have a false negative where you have something that is working but you currently don't have a working theory for why it works or your theory for why it works is not that theory can be easily debunked so we reject it right even though you have something that totally and completely is valid and works like antiseptics in that case it took another hundred or so years for germ theory to come along and to coincide completely with um with antiseptics how many millions of people died from from surgery between now and then due to largely ignorance and complacency. Now, we, to assume that like, oh, that, that was then, now is now, we're, we're beyond that is just unbelievably. No, it, it, it goes back, it harks back to what we were talking about earlier about the conservative nature of, of people, conformists. And this is the way it is, this is what science says, or religion says, or uh, common knowledge or whatever you want to call it and you can't be right you're crazy and history is filled with examples that uh, went against that kind of thinking all the, the, the whole story of progress is the that. whole story of progress absolutely but the the thing that scares me is what doesn't make it into the propaganda how many times were the ultra conservatives successful in putting down something that would have been revolutionary. We'll never know. Never know. Right. Except that we know that it did happen and it's ongoing. Yeah. <laughs> well, in the few cases, in the cases that it did work, it's, it's like people, the person I had on last was a homelessness outreach guy, uh, Brian Braddock. He ran for uh, Florence Mayor, didn't quite make it. Now he's running for city council. Um, very good guy. And uh, one of the things that I learned from him after the podcast was about hitting rock bottom from a homelessness standpoint. Most people do not get off of rock bottom. Most people die due to some kind of, a, not due to some kind of addiction. Most people die while homeless. Mm -hmm. We think of like once you hit rock bottom, that's when you spring back up. Oh no, that's survivorship bias. You only hear about the ones that do. We don't really think about the ones that don't. And it's the same way with um, scientific breakthroughs. We think that if you have some, and, and good inventions and success stories, we have such a survivorship bias that is ignorant of the absolute probability, not absolute, but very strong probability that you will in fact, whether your thing is revolutionary or not, it's likely to fail. And um, you might have- Acceptance. Yeah. You fail to get acceptance, even though your invention, whatever it is, may work. It's valid, right? It's valid. It's very, yeah. Survivorship bias is a 
terrible pattern that keeps arising. The, mo the more I know about uh, the the world, the, the more I like um, Lord of the Rings. <laughs> so <laughs> the more I get into that, and, and the more I, I find myself getting into uh, Christian theology or, or theology in general. I, I, I had a wonderful conversation on another podcast with uh, Deacon Corey Dixon, engineer, and we spent like all the time talking about the love of Christ. Great stuff. Um, next up on um, the next kind of people that I want to talk to is I, I want to talk to an exorcist. Uh, one of the Catholic priests who, who, who do exorcism because th that's a crowd of people who they have to take their work very seriously and they also have to accept that um, they are going to be pariahs like most people are going to think okay. you're, you're quackery, right? And they also have to accept that they really don't have exactly what they're doing nailed down. A lot of it's mental illness, and they have to work closely with psychiatrists to determine when, when things are just psychiatric. I listened to one once, and that's why I wanted to talk to one. And he said, um, there was someone who had schizophrenia, and I, as the exorcist, can't sit there and alone just say it what you have is schizophrenia. They had to be in a room with the psychiatrist and the, the priest to, uh, to explain that what this person was experiencing is just um, paranoid schizophrenia. And the best response came from the patient. He said, I'm really disappointed because if it was a demon, I would have a why. I would have an explanation. And because it's just schizophrenia, I no longer have a why. So that was uh, mind-opening as to w one of the things about that. So, so I'm highly interested in talking to people who um, work in that line of work because it seems thankless and difficult and important, but it seems like it would make you quite a pariah, even within like the Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. uh, they, there, there are still exorcists. There's about a hundred or so in the United States. Um, it's, it's something that the Catholic Church does for people of all walks of faith. Um, and in, within the Catholic Church, most priests don't think they do that anymore. Don't think we even believe that, right? It's more mm -hmm. modern. But that practice and undertaking has been around for so many thousands of years that it would be interesting to, to talk to somebody in the line of work to see what is that all about? Like I'm a rational skeptic. So, so <laughs> I, I, I am fluent in the, in the rational skepticism and like the Ayn Rand and all that. I'm, I'm fluent in that, but I still want to look at what's under that rock. I might be disappointed, but I don't, I don't dare share my thoughts, especially on tape. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> Who cares? Is, if you don't want to, you don't have to. But I'm, now I'm very curious. <laughs> you know I'm not Christian. Yes, I know that. And a lot of that stuff to me sounds like quackery. Yeah. And I think a lot is. That doesn't mean that there's not a small percentage that defies explanation. Yeah. That's one of the reasons why I want to find out. It's mm -hmm. one of the reasons why I want to talk to someone like that. I'd be very curious. I keep an open mind to, about it. To, open mind in this, very curious to see what you find out. Now, of course, participate. But to, to engage with you and find out what you have observed, what you have learned, what your thoughts on the matter are. There were some things that um, I, I, I looked around. I, I, I poked around to, to look at the subject to see if there's any glimmer, if there's condemning evidence about quackery and there's no glimmer of hope, I wouldn't bother, right? There's plenty of charlatans out there and I don't have any intent. And, and They're on television. Right, <laughs> and, and that's the thing is that the people in the line of work, the exorcists are not. Um, there are productions made about that but these largely the people who practice that trade or practice that occupation are not junkies about like the they're, they're not gothic right they're they're, uh -huh. they're there because it's a part of their faith 
or they're there because that's a, a, a need in their community. And some of them uh, say things that I find in, in incredibly interesting, similarly to how like they have a, a system of identifying uh, demonic possession, demonic obsession, and demonic, uh, what do they call it when you're assaulted by one? I can't remember. But um, one of them said something interesting that a demon or a spirit contains space in the way that space and time contain us. And I found that interesting because that is one of the thermodynamic properties of uh, basilisks and Maxwellian mm -hmm. demons. And he's, he's absolutely, the fact that they could come to that conclusion from a non thermodynamic, like fringe thermodynamic standpoint was very interesting to me mm. because I, I, I typically do not get to hear that from anyone. <laughs> so so that, that was one of the things where my interest was very piqued because Maxwell's demon is not a demon; it's a daemon. Right. Um, instantly, daemons and in computer processing is named after Maxwell demon. Right. You, <laughs> I see the smile. Um, so I'm interested. I don't know who I, I would talk to. I guess I would talk to my diocese, diocese, and talk to a bishop. All bishops are technically charged. Like exorcism is some of the things that bishops have to be able to do, um, but there are specialist priests who do that. I myself was raised Roman Catholic. I don't practice myself now. And uh, my Christian theology, once you've discovered the, the love of Christ, you need read no further than anything else. Most um, of my family was, was Catholic. I was not mm. baptized Catholic. My mother was. I might actually be converting soon off of Catholicism into uh, like Messianic Judaism. So I have to talk to a, a rabbi about that and see if that's a good fit. Can you do that here in, in Florence? Are there places to? to uh, there is one in Colombia. That doesn't sound good. No, it's just the chair. Yeah. Um, there is one in Colombia. Um, and there I, is. I know that there is a Jewish center here, a synagogue here. Right. So. It's on Palmetto. Um, I, I guess I would talk to them. The, the, the reason why I would be interested in Messianic Judaism is, is one, um, Having bore witness to the love of Christ, I'm, I'm de facto, in a way, a Christian, always a Christian because of that. But culturally, I don't mesh well with uh, the Christian culture at all. So uh, I find that uh, Jewish culture and Jewish customs is uh, much more my pace. Um, just having. Do you a, have any Jewish ancestry? Yes. Yes. So that's. that's I do too. So. Yeah. Prolific old Jewish minxes get around. <laughs> so, uh, nah, what kind of got me into uh, Judaism is, is my um, relationship with my consultant, who's who's Jewish, very Jewish. In, in a way, well, he's, he's secular now. He's been around um, spiritually a lot, even though I don't like that word either. But he's been he's been everywhere, and uh, I find that I have a lot in common with him and his various conclusions. And I probably have a lot more in common with um, uh, Jewish culture every time I come in contact with it than I have with Catholic, you know, the, the flock, so to speak. Mm -hmm. So like the, anyway, so I, I, I'm interested in that, but I know that that's quite an undertaking. You know, like if, if you ask a rabbi about converting, the first thing they ask you, are you sure you're sane? <laughs> this is quite a bit of work. <laughs> It's quite a bit of work, and there's still a tremendous amount of prejudice worldwide. Yeah, but I'm, for me, I'm such a pariah anyway that I don't. It doesn't really I feel like I can throw stones. You're right. I, I don't. <laughs> you know, I don't. I, okay, so you get to add Jew onto this. Like, what else? What else are you gonna do to me? So it doesn't bother me. But I mean, who's prejudiced against? I never understood that. Who's prejudiced against Jews and why? Well, it's like 2% of the population. So what? Ashkenazi Jews are prolifically intelligent and they make a large number of the... Um, like, are you, have you listened or read Jordan Peterson's work? I have not, no. You would adore Jordan Peterson. 
um, him and Steven Pinker have done uh, wonderful conversations. And I'm, See, I'm familiar with Steven Pinker. I'm almost probably personally, like, <laughs> <laughs> because he's, yeah, Steven is a, another just like gift to the world. But uh, Peterson, you, you would you would enjoy. Um, uh, the only thing about Peterson is, is, is don't believe the propaganda against him. He, he gets called a fascist a lot. There's nothing fascistic about Peterson. That's mm -hmm. just his ideas make certain people uncomfortable, so there's a lot of crap thrown at him. Um, that goes back to what we were talking about earlier, nonconformity and the price that people pay for that. One of the things that they do that society does, that we do to others, in order to discriminate against them, is put a label on them. Whether or not the label is true, we can then relate to that label and throw all sorts of invectives against them. The label is a necessity. You can't prejudice with, you can't be prejudiced Absolutely. towards someone without Absolutely. the label. Absolutely. That's one of the reasons why I'm so scared of this, uh, Identity politics, this wokeism. Um, I have a, I have a close, a good friend who is by far into this neo racism thing, where he's like, racism is not being colorblind or not caring about someone's race, which is absolutely untrue. It's seeing their color and honoring them and asking what you can do to limit their exposure to harmful ideas and all this great. Tripe. Um, look, I understand. Okay, so I, I understand the um, the arguments for let's call it wokeism, where you become a proponent of this intersectional politics. But that's a good intention that the road to hell will be paved with for sure. Yeah. That intersectional that's politics, great. identity politics, is the the precursor language to organized suppression or, or repression. Yes. And it's absolutely true that the preferred state for any kind of label or prejudice is zero. You don't want... Morgan Freeman had a bit where he said, racism is dead when I stop being a black man and I just am a man. And you stop being a white man and you're just a man. That's, that's what the end of prejudices look like. It's not this interwoven system of reparations or... Um, political allocations based off of identity and, and these, that, that's not what the end of racism looks like. And, and it's, it's, that's also not a good route to progress. Those sorts of things that talk about, like, like in the words of Tom Sowell, all of the things that they espouse for the black community in America, he can't find a single country or people in the world where that has ever worked to make them prosperous or happy. Right. Because it doesn't. Doesn't. Right. That's right. And that's that's a very difficult topic to bring up because unfortunately the the evolution of neo racism has evolved to, the, to such where if you critique neo racism, now you're a white supremacist. Right? <laughs> so so if you say if you point out the truth that individual there, there's so much variability on the individual level that any inborn characteristics that you may have inherited from your heritage, uh, that is so negligible on the range of what an individual can think, feel, and believe, and, and do, that it, it's much better just to treat every individual based off of how you would treat that individual, regardless of whatever identifier mm -hmm. you want, you, you could apply to them. Um, they see that as racist and, and evil, and that like what you should do is you should like you know basically be racist, but in a good way. Uh, you know, honor honor people of color for their color or whatever, um, and and dishonor people of privilege, um, or, or or renounce privilege. Right? It's, it's, a, it's a good. They, they do mean well. Um, and the other thing that they take great offense to is generalizations. Uh, they take great offense to pointing out that, for example, any demographic might have some characteristic or bias towards some characteristic, perhaps for some innocuous reason. Um, 
One, one thing that, one landmine that I stepped on was when I was having a conversation uh, in, a, in a group with someone who was interested in, <laughs> it was me, a, a, a friend of mine who was black, and, and then uh, a white liberal came in. I believe the landmine specifically was, maybe some of the reasons why there's such a stigma where fewer, uh, fewer people of African descent tend to, they tend to not swim as often as their European and Asian counterparts mm -hmm. is because in Africa, the proposition of going swimming is very different. You, you do not swim in the Zambezi River. You can in the Rhine because the Zambezi River and the watering hole in Africa is a very dangerous place. And the animals that are around there are predators and the animals will kill humans very mm -hmm. quickly and indiscriminately. So it shouldn't be too much of a shock that over many generations of the ones who go in the water die, right? Uh -huh. That we might have some proclivity to be like, maybe don't go in the water as freely and often and, and maybe be a bit concerned about that and skeptical of it. Maybe that has a play on that. And apparently that was racist because like, I'm not uh, acknowledging the fact that uh, people of color and, and, and black people have uh, access, as much access to resources to go swimming in America. And I, I wasn't denying that. That's absolutely true, too. That's another factor why you don't see as many, uh, you don't see uh, black athletes in the swim, in the Summer Olympics in, in swimming. Mm -hmm. you, you don't. Um, I'm sure there's some individual out there that's like crazy good. <laughs> and also, <laughs> also uh, African American. So. Or, or black American. I don't, I, I don't like the idea. That's another thing that I take that's controversial. I don't like the term African American because we don't call white Americans European Americans, though hereditarily speaking, they have less generation, generational I heritage. I use the term European American to refer to myself. And it's a calc. It's, it's a takeoff on African American. But you're more elegant than most people about that. <laughs> right. My brother-in-law is black. Okay. He's not American. He's you from, can't. You he's can't from St. Martin. He's not African American, and I don't believe he's ever become an American citizen. So uh, I, I have a niece and a nephew who have a black father and a white mother. My niece married a black man. My nephew married a white woman. So in my family, there's it's a melting pot. Yeah. There's, um, there's a movement in like the woke movement that criticizes interracial marriage as like the worst kind of, of cultural appropriation. Like, what are you talking about? This is how humans are. This is how our species is. We, we mix the gene pool. This is how it goes. We don't have Cro-Magnons anymore because, well, they've been either assimilated or killed or walked off a cliff or whatever did in the Cro-Magnon. Into bread. Probably. And Dennis opens as well. And there's another component, genetic component, besides Denisovans and Neanderthals that have been that has been identified, but they don't know where it came from. So we've been Oh, well, there's another missing link. More evidence for one. Human beings, the, the history of humans. Na nature itself has so many, so many things that clash with our cultural expectations. Uh -huh. This is one, one of the things that I don't get about like what I think of as insincere environmentalist movements like these uh, people who want to stop, well, it's, it's, it, again, intentioned well want to stop pollution and return to nature like have you seen nature have you really been out like first <laughs> off it's inhospitable it's 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 really it, it's pretty brutal it's not like this uh you know rainbows and kittens everywhere it's it's mostly things like occasionally a deer will eat a groundhog that's nature that's nature uh, we are we are a stupid species i was just watching on facebook 
where people were getting out of their car. This one woman got out of a car to photograph a grizzly bear. Not a good idea. Not a good idea. The grizzly bear didn't like having his or her photograph taken and chased the woman. <laughs> she managed to escape. But, you know, if you stick your hand in a crocodile's mouth, it's going to go. Bite it off. Yes, I mean, what's with people? We have a romanticized... We have a romanticized vision of nature and a demonized vision of ourselves. Um, these are people who are absolutely, it, it just, it, it, it results in so many distortions in worldview that are just not helpful. People who hate fossil fuels to an irrational extent. Um, there, there are certainly drawbacks to fossil fuel use. Um, I don't need to list them. But people who think like you know what we'll do is we'll ban single-use plastics here in america and that will make the environment so much better the straw problem right that's not really the best bang for buck in terms of cutting off ocean plastics like ocean plastics you should probably invest in in um, waste management infrastructure in developing world countries it's probably the best way mm -hmm. to do it it's a young young man that i can never remember nor pronounce his name um, he is an excellent inventor and entrepreneur on dealing with ocean plastics, arresting them before they get, get in the ocean, okay. doing wonderful work. And as far as I can tell, Greta Thunberg has never actually done anything for the environment other than preach wokeism to people. So I think she's very young, very, very young. And I, I'm not sure that there's much that she can do except inspire people. I don't feel particularly if, inspired. By if, that. if that's what she has done. Yeah. Uh, she just happened, happenstance, to capture the media. To me, I'm, I'm very critical of that because I, I think, or I, at least I recognize it more as a selection. So there's a, frothing sea of people that the media can select yes. as their saint or icon and she happened to be selected in order to iterate the ideas that the tech media culture wants to impress upon a civilization and those ideas come within their own aberrations and distortions in worldview because again these are not people who work in nature or in reality but they work in journalism they work in manufacturing truth instead of discovering it. So I am extremely skeptical of someone like Greta Thunberg. I don't think she has the world experience. This is the person. Can I, I can see, see this. That acts as a mirror. Oh. <laughs> so. Um, I, 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 I don't have anything against Greta Thunberg as a person. But to me, she is a turtle on a fence post. And the action, it's because somebody put it there, right? Yes. So yeah. putting that turtle on that fence post is, one, not fair to the turtle. That's not helpful to Greta. Largely younger people do not deal well with extreme amounts of fame. It distorts a normal and healthy lifestyle. It makes it very difficult to um, stay sane. Two, it's not fair to, uh, to, it's not respective of reality. If you were to select someone, select the guy who's doing ocean plastics, because he's doing, like, you can measure his right. efforts in tonnage that you haven't put into the, into the ocean. That's incredibly useful. When I you, haven't heard of him, but I have heard of Greta one young guy oh. who is actually collecting the plastics. Is it invented, uh, they, like super plastic scooper. Yeah, I think, is he from like uh, Denmark or one of the... Yes. I think it's yeah. probably the same probably person. Probably the same person. Right. Brilliant. Good engineer, good designer, and good thing to put your life towards is, right. is mitigating ocean plastics. Um, we want I, more I'm that. also not sure about Greta, coming back to Greta, that she isn't just mouthing what she's told to say. I... 
just some of the stuff that comes out of her mouth is awfully sophisticated for someone that young. Could be that she is extremely bright. No doubt she's bright. But I'm, I'm not through, sure that it's through independent thinking. I have a, a kind of a, a, a litmus test for whether someone is preaching at me or whether someone knows what they're talking about. I asked them the concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere currently yeah. and what it was in 1960. Mm -hmm. Currently it's about 400 parts per million and change and in 1960 it was about 300 and change. It's gone up by a third. It's yeah. a pretty big jump for a couple decades. Um, I asked them if they're aware of what an interglacial warming period is and where we are in that map. Um, I asked them these things because I, I want to test their knowledge of how geosystem the planet right. actually yeah. works. Yeah. Yeah. Very few people actually pass that. Instantly, the critics of the climate change narrative or the narrative, people who are perhaps partially critical or largely critical, they tend to know, and they tend to be critical because they do know. And I'm not saying that because I, I, I we, we've talked about climate change before. I, I think that largely it's probably a natural variability thing. It might not be. You know, when, when you increase the parts per million concentration of CO2 from 300 parts per million into 400 parts per million in a few decades, that's going to have some consequences. That's right. Yeah. The use of fossil fuels or combustion of any kind produces aerosols that are toxic, that are pollutions. Without the, you can disregard CO2. Mm -hmm. The fact that it makes ozone, the fact that it makes, the, there's non-combusted benzene. We used to put lead in gasoline, for Christ's sake. <laughs> All kinds of pollutions, um, pollution sources come from the burning and uses uh, of combustion, period. It's not just fossil fuels. That's Incidentally, right. fossil fuels, if you are going to combust something and you must combust something, go with fossil fuels over wood uh, mm -hmm. or any other combustible material, except for in some cases. There, there are cases where um, there's waste products that can be incinerated on site in a particular spot where the logistical cost of moving them somewhere else, paper mills is someplace where right. they debark trees and the bark gets burned in gasifier ovens and stuff. Not gasifiers, but they, it gets burned in order to power the, the paper mill. It's, very, uh, it's a very energy intense process. So, um, yeah, combustion is, is pretty dirty in and of itself. But these are things that the so-called Maori critics just don't know, usually don't, are, are largely ignorant of. And the people who are like critical of the critics, they largely do. Mm -hmm. or, or at least more so than the people who are just like mouthing what CNN says. So I see Greta as probably a mouthpiece. I, I, I do too. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so I, I don't... I, and I don't know if I should be should be this way, but I am largely it leaves a bad taste in my mouth when I find out that my opinion has a social engineering attempt against it when someone's trying to engineer your opinion one way or another. I don't like that. I don't like the idea of being socially engineered. Happens all the time. Yeah, by millions of angles that I can't. Absolutely. Control. Yes. So is it healthy to be the kind of person who gets upset at that? No. No. It's not healthy to, it, it's, it's important to recognize it when it's occurring. Mm -hmm. Most people do not. Most people are willingly manipulated. And they're manipulated based upon the pre-existing opinions. confirmation bias. So that's why it's so important to get your propaganda in front of kids before they make their opinion. You can you have something to build off of. Whoa. That's done all the time. Too. It's called public education. <laughs> I mean, Hitler went straight for the kids. Or, or this wokeism stuff. The religious schools are excellent at it. 
Yes. Religious schools would go for it. Hitler went for it. Wokeism is now targeting kids all the time. The, and, and it's it's very subtle. It's very overt for the LBGTQIA plus community when they're trying to educate kids about things like, I'm not even going to mention it on the podcast, but these are like pre-puberty kids that are being taught about things that occur after people reach puberty, reach sexual maturity, and then make adjustments to their lifestyle and how they feel they are, but that's being presented to kids. Like I've never seen any of that. It's, um, is it in public schools? Yes. It's, uh, in the South? No. And, and, uh, in the North, I believe. I, I don't know. Maybe it is in the South. It could be in Florida. I, I've never heard of it. I mean, like, okay. So, so I'm not against drag queens, obviously, but the presentation of, of, of queer culture, particularly to children before they make their opinions on things is uh is concerning it's it's not it it's concerning because the position of like lgbtq stuff is like i said it, i think it's it's most fairly placed as an adjustment after certain norms have been established it's it's an easily allotted for thing but that's not we, we have to recognize I don't understand what you mean by that. Well, okay, for example Because from what I've read, it's pretty much set at birth. Regardless of, of what the causal conditions are. Yes. They tried to maintain that there's a genetic component, I don't know about that. That it's environmental, mm -hmm. I don't know about that. All I know is it's it's set or it seems to be set at a very early age, and it seems to be irreversible. Yes, uh, I, I would agree that largely that's the case. Um, I, I, I would also add that there's clearly a whole spectrum. There, there's people who choose to express one lifestyle over another, and there's people who don't. The majority of them probably don't. The majority of people are born that way, of course. Um, but the allotment... What I find in this part of the country... Don't forget I'm from New York City. Right. I have gay relatives. Right. First cousins. In New York City, in the 1960s, everybody was open. And the things that went on in offices would be called sexual... And I'm talking about heterosexual stuff. Mm -hmm. In offices in the 1960s would be cause for lawsuits <laughs> nowadays i look back and, and i can remember stuff happening and people just laughed they didn't make a big thing of it but it would be called sexual harassment today and getting off topic uh, no, I, I, it's that's completely on topic about like heteronormativism and and how you can go wrong by being too far on the right about that enforcing certain certain uh, social norms, if you will. In this part of the country, I find many gay people try to hide it, they get married, or they lie about it. Yeah. Much more so than I found in living in the, in the North, and where it was much more accepted and, and much more open. Now, pushing an agenda I have mixed feelings about that. Can society be wrong? And I believe the answer to that is yes. And, and, and the example that I would use is slavery. Another example I would use is the suffragette movement, pushing for women's right to vote. And, and we could cite example after example after example. Just because something is a social norm, or socially accepted or not accepted does not make it right. Which gives me a, a chance to make a little divergence, which I would probably be called racist for. Yeah, right. The social norms of the 19th century, and I'm thinking about the removal of the Confederate statues and everything, were different. In those days, and I'm talking about 
up to, say, well, say 1920, to pick an arbitrary uh, date. It was generally thought, right or wrong, by those who were in Europe and its offshoots, like its colonies and so forth, the United States, Canada, around the world, that people with darker complected skin were inferior. Yeah. How far we've you, come. You look at the original, I looked at the original version of the movie Showboat. And I sat in the audience, I was aghast. Because I'm looking at it through modern eyes. They were treating the black people, they were slapping them around and making fun of them. And this movie dates from, what, 1929, 1930? Because it was a talkie. And the talkies came in 1929. As early as 2006, the same attitude of slapping people around towards Asians was was so, fairly commonplace. And then there was the Chinese Exclusion Act that exists, I think, up to 1946, was it? 51? I forget the exact date. I mean, we just can't imagine like doing that today. So we cannot. Right. But to judge other societies against our norms, I think, is a little askew. That is never to justify the wrongs that our ancestors did. That's, that's a very eloquent point. If you're so, going to work with people, you have to... So, coming back now to the original thing, we're talking about sexuality and sexual norms. Mm -hmm. American sexual norms, and I, I'm going to give you an example of a discussion I recently had, a mm -hmm. Facebook discussion with friends of mine, are looked upon by most of the Western world as being wacky. We have Protestant, or we've acculturated Protestant, Puritan sexual norms into our society, and we're very uptight. Not as uptight as the Swiss. The Swiss are worse about it? <laughs> oh, they're worse. Oh. I've been in Switzerland, and I was shocked that there's a society worse than ours. Yeah. But we're Europe very uptight. very open about it. French, very, very open. Right. Germans, a little less so. Belgian. Germans do it with worse style. They don't have the style that French do. But in any case... Sexual norms change. I am very much in favor of gay rights, of women's rights, of African American rights, not as any kind of a special group. I don't think any group, immigrant rights is another thing that I'm in favor of because I have family members or I have friends or I've met people. I've traveled the world. Right, because those those distinctions don't make them any more or less equal than you. I, I, I don't like most people. I told you that before. I think it's true for everyone. <laughs> I, I don't relate to most people. But I've met good and bad all over the place. And, and I don't agree with any kind of discrimination. None. Right. Well, okay. So, and, and so going back to like the the um, the queer culture education towards like third graders and stuff, maybe I don't have the language, or I haven't really reflected on why that's unsettling. But to me, as a straight white male brought up in the South well, as a Roman Catholic, it uh, could be that. It could be that. But maybe, it could be that, and we don't realize how much our childhood experiences stick with us. Well, maybe, okay, so, so one, I should probably share the thing with you eventually, but what, what I was seeing, what I, what I, something doesn't, something about that to me smacks of, um, it smacks of propaganda. And so of course it is. Yeah. Of course. That, that, that's, you're right. Right. Um, I don't think that propaganda is inherently 
Uh, well, I, I think I do think that propaganda is in, inherently not an equality seeking process. It's a promotion seeking process. Absolutely, you're correct. So, it, me as being an advocate for equality, I find those things to be in bad form and fundamentally dangerous. How do we change attitudes? I, I wasn't aware that this was going on, obviously. Right. I mean, I, 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 I'm not sure I approve of it necessarily. I'm not so, sure, as so sure a, either. As, as, as a theoretical question, how do we change attitudes? I would imagine that their thinking is, because this is what Christian evangelicals do, get them young. Right. You change attitudes. You set them in life. Yeah, you're probably right about that. It's probably a, a right. It's it's propaganda. You set set them or set these attitudes early in life, and that's how you do that. I guess it might be idealistic or naive of me to expect that minds will be changed and conclusions will be met through rational discussion amongst adults. Yeah, that's very rare. We, we see yeah, that now true. with the enhanced uh, climate of I'm looking for a word, the political climate of fighting against people who have different ideas than, than we have. I think social media has accelerated that. I, oh, I, I, I agree 100%. 100%. And I've done it myself. Mm -hmm. It's engaging. I've, I have unfriended on Facebook people who I considered lunatics. I don't like extremes of either the left or the right, and people who are espousing any kind of, of nonsense. That, that, that I have a cousin. I just look. I, had, I unfriended him. He's the first cousin. Oh, yeah, the Trump supporter guy. Oh, but this is a different... One. This, this makes my Trump supporter cousins look like flaming liberals. How bad does it get? Oh, he is so bad. I, even my conservative Trump supporting cousin in Florida unfriended him. He is so too, too far right, huh? He is so extreme. And I, I, into like uh, shaving his head and cursing the Jews and all that great stuff. We've Jewish ancestors. Yeah. Our grandmothers, common grandmother's mother, our great grandmother was Jewish. Our grandmother was born out of wedlock. She came here with her grandfather from Germany. They ate on in, in soup kitchens. They slept in flop houses because he was a day laborer and couldn't find work. And yet, he yells and screams about immigrants and <laughs> taking advantage of the welfare system and your own grandmother. Yeah. Your own grandmother. And then upholds, I, the great irony is he holds like white heritage is like really important. Like, hey man, your white heritage was on that welfare. And so I went on his Facebook page and he's, he's just as bad as he ever was. He, oh, I, Lord. And his son is not his son is, is reasonable he he had a son out of wedlock when he was about 15 years old so that he's about 70 and the son's about 55. okay so i see that this guy is a uh, he practices what he preaches so that like moral upright you know i i it, don't it goes back to insecurity to, right yeah I, I don't relate to the kind of mentality that has the us versus them I, I do not, and I have friend, unfriended a whole branch of my family because they went nuts. Do you ever find yourself, so you don't find people who espouse an extreme belief, but do so in good form, eloquently, that you vehemently disagree with, but you can tolerate them? Absolutely. Okay. The other cousin in Florida, who was a Trump supporter, who found the other cousin... He was my favorite cousin when we were growing up. He still is. Mm -hmm. We're still in contact, very friendly on Facebook. You know, I'm not going to travel to Florida. We don't socialize. I do. I've been to Florida to visit him. In any case, I have friends who have different political philosophies than I am. It's the way it's expressed and the attitude, the hatred and the vitriol and the threats 
I have a cousin who, his uh, first cousin once removed, belongs to a right-wing militia in New Jersey. Okay, so wait, wait. <laughs> that, I, I, I see how that's extreme, but my question is, when I, when I see something extreme, is like, is it bad? Is it bad? Yes. You think being a member of a militia is bad? It is bad. Why? When you espouse political assassinations and hatred for Jews, especially when you but have that's a... That's no longer a militia, that's a terrorist group. He has a great great grandmother who was a great great grandmother for him who was Jewish. I mean, like, what's, what's with you people? Lo local militias. He, in addition to belonging to the militia, the ideas that he espouses right. or supports are, are right wing. They are inflammatory. They are threatening. I would say that they are un American, even. Yeah, seditious. Fundamentally, I don't, I don't see uh, participation or militias as, as necessarily always being bad. It depends on what you mean by militia. If you do civil war reenactments, sure, that is it's it's putting on a show. What about the people who uh, go to the border and put people uh, crossing the border on, uh, under citizen's arrest? I disagree with that. I disagree with the law. For sure, I'm not a, a border guy. They are not authorized to do that. That's like me going out and I don't like, I'm, I don't smoke. Right. I take and I punch somebody in the nose who's smoking and take and stomp on their cigarette. Legally, there is, I'm right. not, a, not a lawyer so I don't understand it completely, but from my limited understanding, there are procedures for citizens' arrests. Like, for example, if you see a man beating a woman, you can That is correct. That right. is correct. They, they have committed what is generally considered to be a, a crime, something illegal, or right. or they're engaged in an act of violence and you're coming to their defense. And there are legal, you're absolutely right, there are legal, legal procedures pathways. that cover these kinds of activities. Now, what Going about? to the border and arresting people we suspect of being illegal immigrants, when they may not be. Right. They may be, chances are that they are. They don't have the authority. They do not have the legal authority to do so. That is not a citizen's arrest. Uh, I, I, look, I, I'm not a lawyer. What, so what do know. they do with them? I, I believe, as far as I understand, I believe that some of these militias, or so, at least one of them that I heard of, would go to the border, and if they see a crossing, they would stop and detain them, call the police, and then wait for the police to come. That's a proper procedure. Right. I believe that is a proper procedure. Right. And I, look, again, I don't agree with... Um, that's not making a citizen's arrest. That's calling, that's stopping them and calling the, the duly authorized right. authorities to come and deal with the situation. Well, well you, are, you are, as a citizen, detaining and preventing the other person from fleeing, right? They, they can't leave until... Uh, a law officer shows up and then administrates the law. I believe that's actually the scope of citizen's arrest. I'm not, again, I'm not a lawyer, so I don't know for sure. But, I mean, there's these gray zones where it's like... There are gray zones. Yeah. Yes. I mean, for, for some reason, not for some reason, it seems damn racist and terrible and, like, bigoted in order to just, like, oh, you're a private citizen, you're going to go out and and stop any brown person who's walking in the... And that has happened. American citizens have oh, been yeah. harassed because of the color of their skin or their ethnic background or even their religion. Okay, so, so the other thing, the other side of that coin is like profiling. Profiling is, we, we don't like it in form, but in nations like Turkey or Israel, they do profiling because they must. They, they, they have credible terrorist threats, and they do that because it works. So, on one side, it is in bad form. We want to live in a world where race and color do not matter, and those sorts of things don't, um, don't have any bearing on the judgment of an individual. But in the real world, those sorts of things, if you're in Turkey or if you're in Israel, and your job is to prevent certain things from happening, 
the most efficient way to do that might correlate with something we're very uncomfortable with, and that's difficult to navigate. I'm opposed to it. We pay police officers. Yeah. We pay border guards. We pay ICE to do that. Citizens should not be doing that. I'm opposed to it too. Supposing I go knock on my neighbor's door and she opens the door and she's having a marijuana party. Oh yeah, see how many problems that arise, yeah, that leads to so many other practical problems. Now, I agree that we should round up all non, all illegals, and I'm using this as a hypothesis, and send them back to their country of origin, provided all the legal Americans. All the Americans who are living abroad illegally, and approximately there are one million living in Mexico alone. Just Mexico? Just, Just Mexico. Mexico. Mitt Romney's family. <laughs> Most of them. And sending them back to America. And yes, there are American citizens who fled the American legal system and went abroad to escape American justice, who living abroad yeah. illegally. I mean, if you bring up that very valid and real point, though, you're going against the Cassius Belli, the us versus them, and it is political suicide. Absolutely, no one brings that up. That we have uh, Americans leave. The only people who leave, who, bring, who would bring that up are just looking to score points against the right. Oh, you want a secure border? Well, you know, did you know we have so many? Those are the people who would bring that up. But if you're, if you're trying to If explain, people are here and they're breaking the law, regardless of whether they're a citizen or not, they should be subject to the penalties that the law call, calls for. Right. Well, this is how, in, in practice, if, you were, if we were as sane as we once were, the illegal immigration thing would not by itself get a lot of like budget allocations. We don't just pick people who are illegal immigrants and send them on home. Well, that's how 12 million of them got here. Nobody made a big thing of it. Right. Reagan did what? Reagan gave them all amnesty. Right. <laughs> I mean, Reagan was pretty pragmatic about it. Pragmatic. You're not going to throw them out. You, you can't afford yeah, to put 12 million people on airplanes, confiscate all their property, and process them and send them all back to... Right, to it's just logistically, country. that's impossible. It's plus, impossible. Plus, they're, they're in society now, presumably contributing quite well. But they are contributing, yeah, right. thank you, quite well so, to, to, to our economy and our society. In, in practice, what we used to do when we were more pragmatic about it was... If someone committed a crime and they showed up in our court system and they were illegal, we would say, aha, and on top of that, you're wrong. Yes. Right. Like, that's how we used to act about it. And I think that's the most pragmatic way to do it. So the laws have changed, Brian. Mm. My grandmother came here in 1892 because she was a, uh, born out of wedlock. She didn't have a birth certificate. She never, she told me this herself. She didn't even know what her real birth day was. Well, she celebrated uh, May 25th because she... That's a good day. A good day. In any case, she got on the boat in Hamburg, Germany, got off the boat, no visa, no passport, no birth certificate, nothing. Ellis Island, right? Got off at Ellis Island, 1892. I checked the records on the boat, the Dania, she was processed through. They kept them in quarantine for what, a day or two to make sure they didn't have any illness. And go. There you go. go. Be free. Go. That's it. Yeah, we used to do that. <laughs> when, when, we were, when we were a freer country and we were free because we were growing and expanding, we were just importing people and have at it. That, that, okay, so that's another interesting topic is America's legal strategy for colonization and expansion. Our, this is something that I, I bring up to okay. in Pro 2A or, or Second Amendment. I have to go to the bathroom. Oh, oh yeah, sure. <laughs>